Well, our thanks as always to Home Street Bank for their support of this podcast. If if you're looking for a bank that has it all, great people, great service, great rates, this is the place for you. This is my letter of choice. It should be yours as well. Go to homestreetbank.com. It's your one-stop shop for all your banking needs, both business and personal. That's homestreetbank.com. How soon in the shopping process does the emotion kick in? Sooner than you might think, and we're going to discuss it today on The Buyer's Mind. Welcome to The Buyer's Mind, where we take a closer look deep inside your customer's decision-making mechanism to reverse engineer the perfect sales presentation. Now, please welcome your host, Jeff Shaw. Well, welcome everybody once again to The Buyer's Mind, where we investigate just what's going on into the mind of a prospect who is thinking about making a purchase decision. We always believe here on The Buyer's Mind that if you understand your customer well enough, that sale will begin to roll out right in front of you and you can reverse engineer your own sales presentation by getting to know the customer really well. Uh, I'm your host, Jeff Shore, joined as always by our show producer, Mr. Paul Murphy. Uh, so Murph, when we're thinking about how early that emotion kicks in, does that surprise you? Do, do you do you think about the presence of emotion even in our online shopping? I, I don't. Uh, I, I guess a, yes and no. Uh, you know, you get excited about buying something, uh, especially if you're doing it online because you're looking forward to it. But at the same mm -hmm. time, I also think, eh, I'm thinking through this logically. Yeah, you know, I think that that's exactly what happens. We we think that we're thinking logically when we're shopping online. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that online presence, whether that's in uh, the idea of, uh, of a website or a social media post or even an email, uh, that digital presence uh, still causes us, uh, if it's done right, to engage emotionally. This is what a great uh, a marketing and sales company does, whether that's on a website, social media, even email, whatever it is. And I'll give you a, a picture of this, an example. Uh, go to a website website called johnscrazysocks.com johnscrazysocks.com and this is a great example of an organization that is bringing you in wrapping you in emotionally in other words they they want you to be an emo emotionally vested even before you start thinking about the product now, as you could probably guess, the product is Crazy Socks. But when you go to the website, you're going to find that the story is really about John. And John is a wonderful, wonderful young man who happens to have Down's syndrome. And with his father, he just really enjoyed Crazy Socks. And they built this entire company together called John's Crazy Socks. But again, the great part of it is it's not about the socks. It's about drawing you in emotionally. It's about a really, really great story. Now, that brings us to our quote of the day, and I, I got this. I was reading an article on Forbes uh, from Omar Genblad, and he says, Consumers are no longer just consumers. They are individuals with similar emotions. That's interesting. We tend to think far too much about our product when we consider our digital presence and our digital platforms. What we really need to be thinking about is how do we create an emotional bond and what does that look like? And before we get to our interview, uh, I want to make a suggestion here in the form of a sales tip. Before you post on social media, before you send that email, uh, before you're going to comment on that blog that your customer might read, stop and consider how you will reach your customer on an emotional level. How can you tap into joy? How can you tap into anticipation? So often, we think that when we're going to try and reach our customer, even in the online experience, that it's going to be about this cool feature about our product or, 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 or that opportunity and that, that unique value advantage that nobody else has, or maybe even this special. No, that's not the way your customer wants to buy. Before you post, ask yourself the question, how can you tap into the joy? How can you tap into the anticipation? How can you engage your customer emotionally? 
Well, we're joined by author, keynote speaker, prolific blogger, the CEO and founder of 60 Second Marketer. That's the number 60secondmarketer.com. We'll put that in the show notes. Uh, a really, really interesting guy, especially on the topic of digital marketing. Please welcome Jamie Turner. Jamie, how are you? Hey, Jeff. I am doing great. How are you doing? Good, good, good. Where are you calling in from today, my friend? I am in Atlanta right now getting ready for uh, an overseas speaking tour that'll take me from Barcelona to Nuremberg to uh, Tel Aviv and London, all sorts of places. But right now I'm uh, dialing and, and uh, smiling with you from Atlanta, Georgia. Very cool. Do you find when you're when you're going to different countries that you have to change your message at all to match some of the cultural nuances of, of the international audience? Yeah, I, I love that question because it's actually a very interesting question. I love the study of cultures mm -hmm. and of people and of humanity. Uh, and that question kind of leads us down that path. I'm going to make a generalization with the understanding that this is a generalization. I, I get it. I'm not trying to stereotype anybody. But what I have found is that in the warmer climates, people tend to be more engaged. What do I mean by that? In southern europe so spain or italy or things like that you'll get people in the audience engaged and laughing and sort of engaging with me on stage same thing happens when i'm down in latin america when i get to northern europe so my friends in the netherlands or in sweden or anything like that they tend to be much more reserved and they they almost intellectualize everything they're listening they're participating but all of the participation happens in their brain as opposed to other parts of the world where it happens with their body and their questions and everything like that. So it's it's really kind of an interesting thing to watch that happen in different places around the world. And, and I, you have to sort of adjust your expectations going into that because otherwise you're feeling like, I'm dying right here. Uh, it's just that the audience is just responding differently. I, well, it's funny. I did have that exact thing. The first time I realized that was years ago. I was in the Netherlands. <laughs> True story. And I'm talking to the crowd and I'm, I'm doing my normal stuff to get fired up and they are not moving. Right. They are just sitting there. Yeah. And so I use the common speaker trick. You'd be familiar with it, it, it to get the audience engaged. Sometimes you'll say, OK, everybody grab a pen. I want you to write something down. And it's just a technique to get the audience to participate. Mm -hmm. Nobody moved. And I'm like, OK, seriously, I just want you to grab a pen and, <laughs> and write this down. <laughs> Nobody moves. And finally, somebody out of the kindness of their heart picked up a pen. And I know he was just doing it just to be like, Jamie, I'll take care of you. Mm -hmm. So I got off the hook when the one guy in the audience did that. But it's yeah. really funny how how you learn your lessons as you go through things and you don't take it the wrong way it's right. just they're processing it in their brains and they they don't necessarily want to be asked to do anything because they're because they're listening intently you work in the area of digital marketing you pay a lot of attention to the way that people consume uh, uh their their digital goods uh if you are at a cocktail party somewhere and somebody says you've never met before what do you do for a living H how do you describe that in a way that uh, the layperson can easily understand Oh, another great question, Jeff. I, I, a funny story on that is I was being introduced by my cousin to somebody. He's out on the West Coast, and we were in his office, and he, he introduces me, and he says, Jamie, you know, just introduce yourself. <laughs> and I stumbled over what I did and who I was. And, and we come away, and my cousin goes, dude, you know, I mean, come on, you're in marketing. You're supposed to be able to tell people what yeah, you do. Right. Believe you didn't have that one prepared. Yeah. So I so long story short is now I've I've crystallized it down. I say I'm an author, a speaker, and the CEO of 60secondmarketer.com. And it just sort of gives them enough where if they want to go down the author thing and ask me questions about that, that's great. If they want to go down the speaker thing, I can answer questions there. If they want to go down 60secondmarketer.com, I can answer those questions. But it kind of trot something out there because, you know, we all have multiple personalities and I'm just sort of serving it up to them and saying which which serving do you want? What do you want to talk about? I can talk about anything. What is the the mission, the goal, the objective of 60secondmarketer.com? Um, the stated, so there's stated goals and unstated goals. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in sales and marketing, you often have, this is this is what I'm telling people I'm doing. And then there's the the, the reason you're doing it, not behind the scenes, but sort of the the selfish reasons. So on the, on the, on the non-selfish side of 60 Second Marketer, I love to teach I like to teach people things that will help them in their careers. So 60 Second Marketer is designed to be a blog where people can go and get 
quick tips on marketing that'll improve their marketing or sales tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's called 60 second marketer because you can kind of get in, get out, get back to work. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the more self-centered reason is because I wanted to become a thought leader. I love, as I mentioned, I love to teach. And so getting up on stage and being asked to speak around the globe is like the dream job for somebody like me and somebody like you, Jeff, as well, because mm -hmm. we both like to help people. And the idea of not only being flown overseas or wherever to go talk and then being able to help people in an audience and uh, and and then to collect a check at the end of it is always wonderful. So those are the kind of two reasons. One is to help people. The other is to promote my own personal brand. Over the past uh, several months, as I've got to know you, Jamie, you are a you are a fast thinker, right? You, you're, you're the type of person whose brain is, is uh, moving very, very quickly. Uh, is, is the 60 second marketer brand sort of just consistent? Hey, this is who I am. This is how I think. Uh, I am not the person who's going to write a thousand page textbook. I don't want to do that. Uh, but man, I can help you be more successful in a minute's time. Um, it's funny. The, I, the origin of the idea it was really more of a reflection, less about, I'm gonna do this uh, from my own angle, more about uh, w what happens to all of us. We all get white papers, we all get eBooks. And what we do is we you know, print them out, the, you know, put them on our desk and they stack up on our desk over the course of time. And then every three months we throw that big stack of printed out eBooks and white papers and throw them away and don't ever get around to reading them. So I said, you know what, I'm going to read it for you. I'm going to distill it down so that you can find out the key and most important relevant points in a 60 second blog post. And then you don't have to worry about trying to wade your way, way through a 27 page eBook. I'll do it for you. So that was the origin of the idea was just uh, like we said, get in, get out, get back to work. I know that you are uh, very big on the idea of storytelling. Um, normally, when we think about storytelling, we think about a, a story that is told person to person or perhaps a person to a group of people. But uh, you have a, a particular interest in online storytelling and the way that we use digital and social media, uh, not just to promote a brand or to uh, lure people with some incentive to buy their product, but in fact, to tell a story. Can you talk to, talk to us a little bit about your interest in storytelling and why it's so important to the work that you do? Yeah, well, uh, there's, there's a couple levels on this. One is just from a pure process of how the brain engages with a brand. Uh, we really engage with brands emotionally. And so that's a right brain function. And so when a commercial or a piece of marketing communications makes us laugh or cry, you know, they've done studies with MRIs and it shows that, um, that memories are created when you have an emotion. When you don't have an emotion, uh, then the memory isn't created. And an interesting sort of uh, tangible example of that is if you're at a cocktail party and you meet somebody who is the name of the person you dated in college, that's an emotional thing for you. And you won't forget their name. They'll come up and say, hi, my name's Alice. And you won't forget it because you're like, oh, I remember I dated somebody named Alice. Mm -hmm. But if somebody comes up to you and just says their name, you if you're like most people, you forget it the next minute. Well, that's because emotions create memories. So coming back to how that applies to marketing, marketing, what we're always trying to do is to create emotions to get people's attention and get them to lean in and think about your product and remember your product or service. In the long run, that ultimately results in something called nonlinear marketing. And nonlinear marketing is what brands are doing in the post-advertising era. So what I mean by that is we're in a world right now where when Jeff, when you and I were growing up, we'd watch TV commercials and we'd sit there and, you know, go buy products based on the TV commercials. Well, people aren't seeing TV commercials anymore because they're DVRing through them or they are doing on demand or they're going over the top and watching off their computer. And so the result is marketers are trying to have to figure out how to get connected with prospects and customers. And the way to do that is through something called nonlinear marketing. And again, it's basically where the brand weaves itself into the fabric of your life. So the brand becomes part of your life the way Red Bull does or the way Lego does or the way Starbucks does. And it's less about traditional advertising 
and more about this kind of nonlinear approach where the brand has become part of your life and you hardly even notice the advertising and marketing messages that you're getting because you're participating in aspects of your life with the brand. So yesterday I was in uh, San Antonio, Texas. Uh, I was I delivered a keynote speech uh, to a client, but while I was there, I looked up uh, a, a guy I know that he he was in one of my mastermind groups a few years ago. He I, I said, "Hey, I'm in town. Let me just swing by and say hi." He gave me directions, uh, and he specifically said, uh, "Turn left at the Starbucks. When you see the Starbucks, uh, turn left." And yeah. uh, of course, I didn't drive by that Starbucks. It was 2.30 in the afternoon. I was a little bit tired from my travel. And it's a yeah. Starbucks. I, so, look, I don't even consider myself to be a Starbucks junkie. I'm not the guy who goes to Starbucks uh, uh, every day and brags about it. And yet, there is that nonlinear just sort of built into the fabric of my life that I can't deny. Yeah, absolutely. And if you, if you did, while you were in San Antonio, stop into that Starbucks, all of that stuff that familiarity that you that you the smell the the sounds the cool factor of Starbucks all becomes part of your life and so whether you're in San Antonio or whether you're in any other part of the country it's it's really ingrained in you so it's and it's interesting that the guy was using it as a landmark too mm-hmm. sure yeah right it's well it's so ubiquitous it's uh, <laughs> it makes it easier yeah. to do it uh, these days how does that work online you, you do so much of your work with digital marketing how do you promote nonlinear thinking or nonlinear marketing in an online environment where perhaps someone has never actually uh, physically interacted with a product yeah so you know content marketing is a version it's one aspect of nonlinear marketing so if what you're starting to see now is brands going in and doing almost their their own mini series on YouTube and things like that, mm-hmm. just to get people engaged and to get them to, to participate with the brand. But there's a number of different ways that you can do that. And it it's mostly revolves around providing information for your prospect that's going to help them improve their lives. If you do that, they're going to remember you. So you don't even need to sell. You just need to say, hey, here's something that'll improve your life, whether it's here's a photography video for people who are buying Canon cameras, or here's a a video for some about filling out your tax return for somebody who might need a tax attorney. Both those are kind of nonlinear in nature, and they use helpful content in order to to help people and get them engaged with the brand and ultimately sell them something in the long run. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So the, the idea of content marketing obviously is not new, but what do you think uh, either individuals, sales representatives, or organizations get wrong in content marketing? How, how do you do content marketing poorly? Uh, two things strike me. One is um, too much selling, although sometimes i see brands that don't do enough selling like they'll they'll do a they'll do a bunch of research and write an ebook and then and then they hardly even mention that you know this ebook was brought to you by this company i'm a fan of look if i'm reading your ebook and i know you've put a lot of time and effort into it i'm okay if there are paragraphs in there that say here's what our research found and oh by the way we solved that problem through our product and I, so i'm oftentimes pushing that a little more but the other side of the equation is of course you don't want to come across as uh inauthentic or 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 too pushy the 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 other thing is uh, a lot of times people think that anything in marketing or sales is going to be a silver bullet so they they assume you know if i just do youtube videos once a month that's going to solve my problem the reality is as you know and i know as well it really marketing and sales is all about consistency and doing a number of different things and it has what i call circular momentum which is basically the snowball effect if you keep doing everything it just kind of keeps going around in a circle and it builds on itself and suddenly every little piece adds up and helps the other little pieces but it's the the biggest mistake i think is people thinking well i'm just going to do one thing and it's going to solve all my problems and of course that's not a realistic expectation you know i will post things on uh facebook uh, on a regular basis thinking okay i'm i'm i want to serve my client here i want to be able to give him good stuff and there are times where i'll post something and and i'm really 
legitimately excited about what I'm posting. This is going to get huge uh, likes and shares and everything else. And then I get crickets. And, and then I'll post something that is almost a, an afterthought and just people go nuts and I got comments for days. Uh, what, what am I doing wrong here? And what are, as our, as our listeners are thinking through how they're using social media, is, is there a, 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 a check down list that you could look at and say, these are the things that are going to play. These are the things that are not going to play. Well, you and I are in the same camp in the sense that we're often surprised by what what catches on and what doesn't catch on. Mm -hmm. And and so you and I are both doing the same exact thing, which is like, oh, this is going to be great. And I'm up late tonight writing this and it's just going to go viral. And it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And it drives me as crazy as it as it does uh, you. What I have found and there is a solution to this, but um, I'm reminded of the guys from Seinfeld were being interviewed, all of the actors. Huh. And they were talking about all of those themes that came through Master of Your Domain, all those different things that caught on, mm -hmm. uh, the soup Nazi, everything. And the, and the interviewer was saying, so did you guys like know that these things were going to catch on? And they said, we never knew what was going to catch on and what wasn't. And we can't tell you how many times we thought we had something that was just going to go viral. And we would do it, trot it out there on an episode, and it wouldn't catch on. And then something that we just <laughs> was a throwaway would catch on. Mm -hmm. So the, the 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 bad news is is that you, it's hard to predict what's going to catch on. I still have not figured out the science behind it. Uh, the good news is is that there is a solution, although it requires requires work. I had a good friend of mine named Lon Safko, author of the Social Media Bible. He wrote. He studied. Another friend of mine named Dave Kirp, and Dave's had huge success on LinkedIn, and everything he does goes viral now. So Lon was like, well, let me look at this and figure out what Dave's secret is. He did an in-depth analysis. Um, and this is not to take away from Dave, because Dave works very hard and is very smart. But Lon's analysis was what worked was that Dave does this all the time and really works hard to consistently put out quality stuff. There's no reason why blog posts or LinkedIn post number one went viral, but number eight didn't. Mm -hmm. It's more about at bats. And Dave just is at bat all the time. And if you get at bats enough times, you're going to eventually hit one out of the park. And again, Dave does a great job. He's smart. He's written great books of his own. So I'm not saying he doesn't write great stuff. I'm just saying he's got that one, two punch, which is one to write great stuff two to do it consistently and all the time. And eventually you break through and and really hit that grand slam home run. Uh, it, you know, it's really, really interesting when I when I, uh, I think through all of our marketing efforts and how much of it is just be consistent, just get yourself out there over and over again. I, I do think we have a tendency to look and, and as you say, look for the home run, but it's it's really just a series of, of singles. You mentioned earlier about the idea that we we connect with brands uh, on an emotional level. When it, it makes us laugh, it makes us cry, a memory is created, the emotion rides along with that memory. Uh, do you, are, I, I'm going to go out on a limb here and, and suggest that you would probably say that when it comes to our marketing efforts, we don't pay nearly enough attention to the emotional side of things. We we think, well, we're a business. It's the business world. You you don't really fool around with somebody's emotion because it's squishy or it's not professional or whatever the case may be. My, my guess is that you your advice would be no, 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 no. Dive and dive deep. Yeah, I think um, I think the, the 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 flaw that you really basically laid it out there exactly right, which is imagine yourself as a marketing director at a corporation. Your job is to make sure that you know you move the needle. So you're a little bit nervous about spending all this money on marketing, and you want to make sure that you cover your bases. So you're looking at the communications that comes through, and you go, "All right, did they did they get all of our features into this? Did mm -hmm. they get all of the benefits right. into this? All of the stuff that is like the little check marks on your brain that say, "Oh yes, I'm I'm doing everything I need to do." But the reality is, is the most sophisticated and the most successful marketers understand that that nuance which is hey it's really about having one emotional thing that hooks them i call it the lead and feed approach the lead is hook them with emotion the feed is feed their logical brain with all the reasons to buy the product so so that lead and feed approach it's a one-two punch lead with emotion and then once you've got them hooked 
then you can start selling them on the logical side of the equation. But a lot of times people try to flip flop that and it doesn't really work all that well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you uh, find yourself surprised at the the very frequent disconnect that organizations have between their marketing message and the actual customer experience, and in particular, the customer experience as it relates to uh, a, a salesperson or the, the actual physical encounter with an organization? Yeah, there is that that goes on. What, what I have found, which is good news on this front, is that often the DNA of an organization seeps into their sales and marketing programs organically. So what I mean by that is every organization has its personality. Usually it comes out of the founder, you know, whatever kind of personality they were, if they were wild and crazy or if they were more studious, that kind of trickles down because the people who were hired early on match that personality. Mm -hmm. And then that becomes the corporate DNA. And what I've found is that to a certain degree, there's more of that happens naturally and organically where the messaging that a salesperson or a marketing person is putting out to the community is in keeping with the brand personality. But you definitely do uh, have situations where you really need to kind of make sure that communication happens so that so that everybody's talking and saying the same things. And, and that takes discipline and execution. And where where people fall down in corporate America sometimes I think is great strategies with bad execution mm -hmm. and, and 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 then that doesn't end up working a, a a great a mediocre strategy with great execution will beat a great strategy with bad execution every single time so so the the secret sauce as far as i'm concerned when it comes to making sure your sales and marketing teams are on the same page and saying the right stuff to the uh, prospects is make sure they're executing the plan as stated so that we're check marking all of those things and making sure we're speaking the same voice saying the same stuff and all that sort of good stuff that makes a brand a brand yeah we're just at uh, about out of time here jamie before uh, you need to uh, get on a plane and travel all over the world just a couple of last questions here uh give us just one or two books that you've read ever in your life that had a profound impact on your thinking uh, well, first of all, I want to thank you, Jeff. And I know you're on planes all over the world as much as I am. And, and I'm honored and flattered to be here. And, and, and it really does uh, work out for me. Uh, two books, uh, one of which I read probably 15 years ago was uh, um, The Seven Spiritual Laws of Success by Deepak Chopra. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was really about uh, surrender and getting in sync with the universe and letting go. And it, it hit me at a very specific time that was very, very uh, meaningful to me. The other one, it's called The Lords of Strategy. I can't read the guy's uh, name, the author's name from, from this far away. If you want to make your brain expand and understand how big time thinkers think about big subjects in corporate America, read The Lords of Strategy. It's the history of the management consulting world that started in the 1950s and continues to today. And it just talks about these people and why they, you know, what they saw as their, their angle for their companies, whether it was McKinsey or Bain or Boston Consulting Group. And I got to tell you, I read that book and my I, I literally think I was smarter by the end of reading it. I mean, it was just amazing how how big a book it was. And it's not that hard to read. Mm -hmm. You just have to pay attention. So those two books, uh, Seven Spiritual Laws of Success and The Lords of Strategy, both great books. Cool. Uh, most beautiful place on the planet you've ever stood. When I was in college, I was backpacking through Europe. I met some uh, young young women. I'll just be honest yeah. with you. We went up to a, mount, a cliff on 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 the North Sea in Scotland, and looked out over the the cliff uh, at the ocean and watched the sunset. And when you're that far north in the summertime, the sun sets about 11 p.m. at night. And sat there and drank wine and ate, ate cheese and and bread and watched the sunset. And to this day, I still say, you know, that was one of my favorite things of all time. Love it, love it, love it. And finally, uh, at your retirement party decades from now, Jamie, uh, you want people to say, if there's one thing I learned from Jamie Turner, it would be this. I'm going to go on a limb here. There, there's two two things that are crossing my mind. One is I, I do take uh, great pride in, in being a, a good husband and a good father. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
uh, the results of working very hard at being a, a father and a husband seem to be paying off. I've got three daughters who are just amazing. Uh, the other thing is, uh, you know, I think we live in a world and a culture. I'm going to get a little off track here, but but I'll cut to the chase. I think we live in a world and a culture where spirituality and greater meaning and a higher power are being taken out of our daily lives. And I think it's to the detriment of our country. And and I would love if uh, at my retirement party, people said, here's a guy who was successful, but also who practiced um, good uh, ethics and morals, many of which are written in books like the Bible or like Seven Spiritual Laws of Success or the Torah or any of the other things. But the bottom line is, I think our country would benefit greatly if we brought a honoring of a higher power back into our daily lives. Uh, great words from uh, Jamie Turner, uh, who is just a, a, obviously a, a brilliant business thinker, but moreover, and I think we've learned this in our time together, just a really genuinely good guy. I'm, I'm proud to call him a friend. Uh, I, I'm, I'm so thankful uh, that Jamie took the time to be able to enlighten us today. Jamie, thanks for being on The Buyer's Mind. Jeff, I'm flattered and honored. And anytime you want me, just holler and I'll be there. So thank you for having me on. Let's do it. So Murph, uh, you get the sense that uh, Jamie's the type of guy where, uh, you know, if if you had to spend a weekend somewhere with somebody, there there would be worse guys to hang out with. He just is a really good guy, isn't he? Well, and, you know, you can always sense when people have good positive energy, right? And, and yeah, he really brought that yeah. to the interview. So really, really enjoy right. that. Yeah. Well, I think that's what what uh, Jamie and I are part of the same ma actually invited me to be a part of his mastermind group, a bunch of uh, keynote speakers that share best practices. But I said yes, because his positive energy is uh, so strong, as you just said, and he's got some great content. But but I, it's interesting to me, Murph, right away, you gravitated towards the positive energy more than anything else. It doesn't diminish his content, but it certainly makes his content uh, uh, far more intriguing. And, and it makes me want to pay attention to his content because he has positive energy, right? It does. Well, and I hope that that's what we bring with the buyer's mind. Uh, sure. You bring a lot of positive energy as well. And uh, as, as he said, you ask uh, interesting questions. And when you provide that kind of content, it is useful for people to use. I love uh, the concepts uh, that uh, Jamie was bringing out, especially as uh, as it regards to the idea of how we engage with brands emotionally. This is something that we've talked about in the past at the buyer's mind. But uh, he, I, I, Jamie put it this way: when we when it makes us laugh or it makes us cry, then memories are created, and those emotions right along with the memory. And that's exactly the way that uh, emotions work, and and how they interplay uh, with that memory. I do think that we can have a tendency to underplay this. It's something that I've held for quite some time that we can say, well, we don't want to get too gushy or squishy or weepy on all of this. But the fact of the matter is our customers are emotional creatures and they make decisions out of their emotions. So we, when we ignore that, they actually make worse decisions. That's the work of Daniel Kahneman. But but I, I would look at it and say, when we can attack that emotion and, and attach to that emotion, that really uh, uh, helps our customer to move along. So I just want to challenge all of you right now listening in to ask yourself the question, are you willing uh, to even show your own emotion? So for example, one of the things that we see with sales professionals that are very effective is that when they uh, offer the principles and, and, and live out the principles of emotion endorsement. I'll give you an example of what that looks like. Years ago, I wanted to take part in the San Jose Sharks fantasy camp. Uh, you, 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 you went down to the uh, Sharks arena, you went to their locker room, you, you uh, practiced and then played a game with former Sharks players. And it, it's just a great experience. Had a great time. One of the reasons I decided to do it is when I picked up the phone the very first time, called somebody in their office and said, hey, I'm interested in this Sharks fantasy camp. And her response sounded something like this. Oh, I am so excited for you. This is going to, you're never going to forget this day. It's going to be one of the most enjoyable days of your entire life. Good for you. My name's, and then she gave me her name, whatever it was. But the point is that I still remember that phone call because her emotional endorsement of what I was considering purchasing was so profound that I adopted it. I just picked it up as my own. And I want to challenge all of our listeners right now just to ask yourself that question. 
does my customer see my emotional endorsement? Do, do they see that I am willing to engage emotionally? Because mark my words on this, your customer will never outpace you emotionally. So if you are showing no emotion, then your customer is going to pace that. They won't show it. They, it's very difficult to show emotion in the absence of the salesperson. So if you are willing to uh, lend your emotional credence uh, to what it is that you're selling, your customers will buy in on that. So I just want to encourage you, fall in love with what you sell. Fall in love with what you represent. And if you are in love, let your face know. Because when your customer buys off on that, when they pick up that emotional endorsement, they claim it as their own. It is so much more enjoyable and so much easier to buy when I feel like I have permission to be engaged emotionally. That's when you have the opportunity to help them do what they want to do anyway. That's when you have the opportunity to change their world. Well, there you go. Another episode of The Buyer's Mind. If you're enjoying the podcast, make sure you subscribe to that. would really appreciate that. Leave a review if you wouldn't mind, too. But that's another wrap on our podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. You can find everything you need at jeffshore.com. But until next time, my friends, go out there and change someone's world. Yeah.